Hi everyone, and welcome to Advanced Yield Line Analysis of Slabs in Buildings, which is a webinar that will provide you with an overview of our yield line analysis software, Limit State Slab, and how you can use it to analyze a range of reinforced concrete slab problems for buildings, often demonstrating that existing slabs have reserves of strength that other methods might miss. My name is Tom Pritchard, I'm the Limit State Slab Product Manager and I'll be presenting the second section of today's session. I'll be joined by Matthew Gilbert who is Managing Director here at Limit State. Today's webinar is due to last around 45 minutes and it will include a few minutes at the end for you to ask some questions which you can post at any time using the question box in the webinar interface that you should hopefully have in front of you. We do try to answer as many of your questions as we can, but this is not always possible in the time available. We do apologize if we don't get round to yours during the webinar, but we will follow up on all queries in the days afterwards, so everyone should get a reply at some point soon. Also, if you think of anything after the webinar has ended, you can always contact us via email on info at limitstate.com and we'll be more than happy to get back to you. So, for the first part of today's webinar, I'd like to introduce Matthew Gilbert, who will be speaking about the background of automating the yield line method. Thanks very much, Tom, and thanks very much uh, for joining us today on the webinar. So, the first slide I'm going to show just uh, gives you an indication of um, the, the range of applicability of the, the method that we're going to be presenting. On the left-hand side, you can see some characteristic yield line patterns of the sort you might see in textbooks. On the other hand, on the right-hand side, you see uh, more practical um, and realistic uh, geometries that you might encounter in, in real building uh, floor plate design problems. So the one in the center is actually um, taken from a real um, residential um, development from some years ago in London. And you can see there the, uh, the quite complex yield line pattern that the automated yield line analysis method has, uh, has picked up, which would be challenging to identify uh, manually. And just to kind of uh, paint the picture uh, a little more uh, um, fully, uh, we've also got now um, animations showing the murder response of each of these, uh, these mechanisms. So, as you'd expect on the left-hand side, um, but perhaps uh, not intuitively obvious from the yield line pattern uh, on the right-hand side, what that murder deformation is going to look like. In the bottom right case, um, returning to that London uh, floor plate, you can see it's effectively a sort of folding plate mechanism where we have this deep valley uh, going from the front to the back of the building. So, we'll... Uh, um, talk a little bit more about the background to uh, uh, the method, um, but um, what I'm going to do to start with is uh, kick off by saying a few words about the company uh, before um, moving on to uh, give a demo and explain how it works. Then Tom Pritchard will take up the reins for the second half of the, uh, the presentation. So who are Limit State? Uh, what do Limit State do? Um, well, our mission is to provide engineers with powerful software, primarily for the ultimate Limit State um, analysis scenario, but also design in, in some cases. Uh, we take advantage of optimization tools that are not used in, in mainstream products. We make sure the software is robust, easy to use, well validated, and also fully supported. And we have um, well over 100, uh, over 150 companies using the software in over 30 countries worldwide, including some, some very large companies, but also some smaller companies as well. In terms of where we fit in the, um, the range of tools, particularly software tools available, we basically sit in the middle between traditional hand type analysis tools, so typically automated in simple software programs or, or perhaps in a spreadsheet at one extreme um, and nonlinear finite elements, for example, at the other end of the spectrum. We've got tools which use generally applicable numerical rigid plastic uh, analysis methods to give you what we believe many of the benefits of, of both of those um, 
two tools, traditional and advanced. Um, in terms of um, building on traditional tools, conceptually s simple, few inputs um, are typically required, but like the advanced tools, you can put in arbitrary geometries, arbitrary distribution of material properties, albeit with a, a rigid plastic uh, model. So you get many of the benefits of the advanced tools at one, one side, and you get the benefits of easy to set up and solve, uh, quick to solve as well, that you have with the traditional tools at the other. In, in the context of today's talk, um, we're automating the yield line method and applying the automated yield line method to building analysis, assessment. I um, need to say a few words about the yield line method for those of you who are not familiar with it. It's actually a method that's been around for almost a century. Um, the term was first coined, we believe, in a paper published in the Structural Engineer in 1922 and uh, um, subsequently greatly developed by uh, Johansson in Denmark in the subsequent decades. In the context of um, limit analysis, plastic analysis methods, uh, it was later shown that the yield line method is a basically an upper bound plastic analysis method for those of you familiar with that area. Um, it's got some strong points and some, some, some disadvantages as well. Strong points are that it um, gives you a, a, a direct estimate of the collapse load. Um, in terms of hand calculations, pretty simple to carry out. Um, and big benefit is it leads to economical designs from a design context uh, or in the context of um, assessment to more realistic assessments of the, of the true capacity of an existing slab. Traditionally elastic methods have tended to um, underestimate the capacity of um, slabs. The downside is you need to choose the correct mechanism otherwise you're going to overestimate the, the true collapse load and the, another con is that it only considers flexural failure, doesn't consider shear failure, doesn't consider you know, deflections prior to failure, for example. Um, around sort of 20 years ago or so, there was renewed interest in the method. Um, the context of bridges, um, Middleton and co-workers at the University of Cambridge showed that many uh, concrete slabs in, in bridges, in this case, had hidden reserves of strength. So what was happening was that many bridges which had been designed for a given loading were condemned um, when the um, axle loading, the vehicle, gross vehicle weights increased. Um, <coughs> and certainly the elastic assessment suggested that many bridges had insu insu insufficient capacity. However, when you moved to do a plastic analysis, you found in many cases those bridges did have the uh, capacity. So here we can see we've got 21 bridges and the vast majority of those bridges which were inadequate according to elastic assessment methods were actually found to be perfectly satisfactory when plastic methods were applied. Um, in terms of the, the method that was used, um, Middleton and co-workers came up with a library of potential failure mechanisms. So you can see on the right-hand side, we've got 27 failure mechanisms. Um, so um, you know, many potential modes of, of failure were modeled. However, there's always going to be a slight danger that perhaps there's mechanism number 28, which is actually critical in your bridge, which isn't picked up um, in this existing library. So there's a slight danger that you end up um, overestimating the capacity. And certainly that's something that, that, that we've been trying to, um, or we, we, we've addressed with the full automation of the, uh, the yield line method. In terms of buildings, um, similar time, there was a lot of interest in using yield line design um, to reduce the complexity of reinforcement and also the, um, the tonnage of steel required um, in a given um, floor plate. So we can see here that um, a number of um, areas of the building uh, constructed as part of the Carlington European Concrete Building Project some years ago. Um, each floor had uh, a different uh, design approach, and you can see that the 
yield line design led to the uh, the minimum weight of steel required and also to almost the simplest um, form of um, um, reinforcement as well so 22 bar marks per floor um, thinking um, of, of, of buildings as opposed to bridges that we were looking at earlier um, we can say that often you will have uh, less regular shapes so the option of having a library of potential failure mechanisms is, is less tenable. If you've got an existing building, um, we can hopefully um, um, apply the, the method and in many cases identify hidden reserves of strength. And if we do, then clearly strengthening works can be avoided and in the case of concrete uh, buildings, those strengthening works are often very, very expensive. So if we can avoid that, then we can save huge amounts of money. Question about deflections. If you've got an existing building, then obviously you can try to estimate the deflections using analysis. But another pragmatic way of uh, dealing with that is to simply do load tests. So you can have, for example, containers of water, pump those through with, uh, pump those, um, well, take them up empty, fill them with water, measure the deflections, and you can very easily check that the uh, deflection um, limits are, are, are reasonable or the defection um, behaviour is, is okay okay so I've talked a little bit a bit of background there's, there's no substitute however for, for diving into a, um, um, a demo of the software before we go further so I'm just going to start up the software um, I'm number of inbuilt um, projects um, but what I'm going to do is I'm just going to use an empty project and actually um, create a simple um, slab geometry by hand. Um, in terms of um, what we need to enter, um, enter some details of the um, the project and the geometrical extents of the project, um, and we end up with um, a, a grid which we can use to actually manually construct a geometry. Now. Clearly, this is this is this is one way of of proceeding. Another way of doing it is to simply import from CAD using a DXF file um, um, a um, a file that represents your geometry. If you've got an existing CAD file, that is, and you can um, do it that way. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just you can you can draw. Um, as you as you see fit, I'm just going to draw a simple geometry. Um, I want some kind of sort of some, uh, kind of lozenge shape is uh, what I can draw here. Um, I can turn off the the grid when I don't need it, and I end up with a, a geometry. I can define a material, so I can I can basically. Um, um, create a, uh, a material or structure definition as it's called in the software or I can drag and drop one of these inbuilt ones just for the purposes of this demonstration. So I'm just going to, in, in this case, just drag a unit MP weightless um, structural definition to this slab. I also need to apply some loads to the slab and also some supports. So in terms of the supports, what I could do is I could um, select everything um, then dive down and and select the external boundaries and then choose what types of support I've, I've got in this case let's suppose they're simple and then you can see that uh, hatched marking indicating the simple support and the last thing to do is to apply a load so I can apply a point load a line load or in this case I'm going to apply a pressure load across the whole of the the slab um, and again to keep things simple I'm going to have a unit pressure load and that's now indicated on the um, on the slab on screen so now all I need to do is is click solve and what the software is going to do is it's going to show me the uh, the critical yield line pattern and I can also animate the um, the mode of response 
And in fact, I can, if I just change the um, analysis um, options, I can actually um, an animate uh, that automatically. So if I solve it again, it finds the yield line pattern and then it animates the, um, the mechanism just for visualization purposes. So what have we actually done? We put a unit pressure load on the on the slab, and we had a unit um, um, reinforcement. So a plastic moment resistance is how we defined it. So a, a unit plastic moment resistance per per unit length, and in the output box we have a solution of two point seven five. That is actually a multiplier on the applied load. It's referred to as an adequacy factor in the software. So instead of having um, um, a, a unit load, one kilopascal um, causing um, failure, we have um, 2.75 times one, i.e. 2.75 kilopascals um, causing collapse in this particular case, or kilonewtons per, per square meter. Now, because this, this always works so quick to use, I can very easily um, ring the changes. I can look at what if scenario? So, for example, let's suppose if I wasn't confident that these um, supports were actually able to restrain upward movement of the of the slab, so I could actually select um, the uh, the slab. Um, in this case, I've, I've selected it using the cursor, and I could allow lift off. Um, so, without lift off, I've got a, an adequacy factor of two point seven five. With lift off, you can see I actually have a slightly lower um, value, 2.6, and you can actually see then that the the corners of the slab are actually lifting off, just simply at the corners. At the other extreme, maybe um, I actually make some changes, and I'm confident that these. Um, boundaries are actually not simple, they're actually fixed, or partially fixed, that's another option, but I suppose they're fixed. Um, how does that change things? Well, instantly we can see that we have a, a more complex failure mechanism, and we have a much larger um, adequacy factor, so almost uh, well, the order of double um, the previous value. And we're getting these um, um, distinctive um, um, patterns near the corners of the um, of the slab. So hopefully that gives given you a um, a, a flavour of how the, um, um, the software works in practice. How does it work in terms of the theory? Just a few words about the method that we use in the software. We actually use something called discontinuity layout optimization, um, or DLO for short. It's a method that was um, discovered relatively recently. Uh, the key publication um, in uh, Proceedings of the Royal Society in 2014. It's actually a quite a nice follow up paper in the Structural Engineer um, about six months later, which is a little bit more user friendly. And the key thing is it boils down to a simple linear optimization problem, which is why we can solve problems very, very quickly. In terms of how it, how it, how it works conceptually, if we imagine we've got um, a simple slab geometry, in this case it's a square slab, we populate that geometry with, with nodes, we connect those nodes with potential yield lines, and then we use optimization to find the, the minimum energy or critical um, layout of yield lines or yield line pattern as you can see on screen with hogging and sagging yield lines shown in in red and blue respectively just some uh, um, sort of validation examples um, there's some you know, well-known solutions for simple square slabs certainly um, in this case, we've got the, f the first two slabs, on, on the, the left two slabs, have a pressure load. And uh, with simple supports, we get the exact solution 
um, very easily. In the second case, the middle case, where we have fixed support, we can get to within 0.01% of the analytical optimal solution for that problem. And on the right hand side, we've got actually got a, a different learning regime. We've got a, a, a point load applied to the middle of the slab, and we pick up this fan type mechanism and get a similar degree of accuracy. Regular slabs, um, no problem. Because it's general, the method, we can put in any geometry you want. Um, this is a, a geometry from the literature. So a number of uh, different workers have attempted to solve this using various methods. Uh, in this case, um, the DLO method gives a better solution than any other method we could find in the literature. When I say better, I mean uh, lower because it's an upper bound uh, limit analysis method. Um, next example is actually the apartment block that I mentioned um, right at the start it's in St John's Wood in London. And you can see just from the facade that we've actually got quite a, uh, an interesting irregular geometry. This particular apartment was actually used in a guide produced by the Concrete Centre in the UK in 2004. And they actually used hand-based yield line method to um, design this, this floor slab. Um, what I need necessitated is a whole series of different potential yield line patterns to be considered. So you can see many on the right-hand side. And then on the left-hand side, you can actually see this folding plate type mechanism, which is actually quite similar to the one that we found to be critical. And then this is the, um, again, the uh, computed um, mechanism um, obtained using um, limit state slab. I actually uh, described this in more detail in a uh, journal paper it published in the American Society of Civil Engineers a couple of years ago, if anybody is interested. Um, the interesting thing is here, this folding plate mechanism is certainly more critical than the um, the mechanism identified by uh, Kennedy and Goodchild in their, in their guide. Um, but actually, the difference is not that great. 7 or 8% um, lower in this particular case. So that suggests that they had, you know, clearly the requisite expertise to design their slab using the yield method. The worry is that perhaps not everyone is as expert as them. However, with the automated method, um, it's much more likely you're going to find the, the critical uh, mechanism. Okay, so I'm going to um, hand over now to uh, back to Tom, who's going to talk you through the, uh, the software in a slightly more in-depth uh, manner. Thanks, Matthew. So I'm just going to quickly go through a couple of cases, um, the first of which is a case of prop loading in a building that's being refurbished, and the second of which is the case of some plant loading, so we have moving loads across the um, floor slab, and again, in a, a building that's being refurbished. So for the first one, what we have is an existing multi-storey office building which is undergoing some repurposing works and it's of the nature of this one on the right hand side here. And we're looking at the first floor slab and it's needing to take some props while work is carried out on the floor above. So there'll be loading associated with those um, imparted onto the first floor slab. Um, there have been some opening up works and they've provided details of the current slab um, geometry and the beam reinforcement um, within that floor slab. And the question that we're going to ask ourselves is, can the slab on this first floor carry the proposed loading from the props at the ultimate limit state? So um, we're going to look at how to do that within the software. So if I just go back to it, and what we saw earlier was that Matthew actually drew out by hand this um, lozenge-shaped floor slab. What we're actually going to do is use the different method of bringing in a geometry and that's by importing a DXF. So if we look here, I've got a DXF file that's already been generated um, and I'm going to click on open and we can see here that we get um, an import dialog 
which tells us what size the problem is. Um, if we need to edit the geometry to try and translate it or scale it, then we can do that. Um, and at the bottom here, I guess the most important part of it is it's asking us which of the layers in the DXF file that we would like to import. And in this case, we're going to import all of it. Um, so if I click OK, we can see here that we have a slab that has been brought in with some construction lines, which are these dotted lines here. But if I turn those off, we can see that we actually have solid zones that have been um, generated by the software by looking at the DXF file and asking, OK, where are the closed loops within that DXF, so where the lines join up? Um, I'm going to make those into zones to be used within the limit state slab. So we have here one, two, three, four, five zones that have been marked out. So the next thing we need to do is to actually generate some materials and apply those to the slab. So uh, we saw earlier Matthew doing that. Uh, we're going to do a very similar thing again. So you can either right click and put a new structural definition or we can go through the structural definition um, wizard here. Um, we want two types of material. We want one for the slab itself and one for the beam that's going through it. Uh, both of those are going to be a flexural type. So if I start here and we'll go for slab, I'll just make it a slightly dark bluey grey colour, maybe slightly lighter than that, so that we can differentiate it from the other materials. And in the properties here you can see, again, um, the hogging and sagging moment capacities and the angle of the reinforcement. Um, all we're going to do for this particular case is keep the reinforcement at 90 degrees to each other along the Cartesian axes, but we're going to put in our own values for the hogging and sagging moment capacities. So for the slab itself, we're looking at a capacity of 151 kilonewton meters per meter in either direction. And down at the bottom here, we have a thickness and a unit weight. So obviously, if we are considering um, structural self-weight as part of the problem, then we can add in our geometry here. And so we're going to look at this. And the thickness is 35 centimeters, and the unit weight is going to be 24 kilonewtons per meter cubed. So we have all the information we need for our slab here. Click OK. So you can see it's made that material. Just going to do another one a little bit quicker for the beam. I'm going to make that a dark blue color. And as you may expect for a beam, it's actually going to be quite a lot more um, strong, strong than the slab. So we've got 4653 and in the first direction and 151 kilometers meters per meter in the second direction. The thickness of it is slightly thicker than the slab as you may expect at 0.7 and the unit weight is going to be the same. So now we have the two materials that we want to apply to our problem, I can just drag and drop as necessary onto it there. This little square in the middle, we actually want that to be a column, uh, and that's quite um, a good lead into what we're looking at next, which is going to be the boundary conditions. So first thing, like I say, we want that to be a column, so I'll delete the little square there and select the external boundaries around the edges, and we can change the support type here to fixed. So this is a column that's attached, um, that's going through the floor slab and is attached to it as it goes past. I can also see in the bottom left hand corner here, there's a little bit of a notch. Uh, that's where there's another column. And in this case, we're going to select the external boundaries and they can be simple. So this is where there is uh, freedom of movement for the column and the slab around it. And lastly, we have along the bottom boundary here, a fixed boundary, and on the right hand side here, actually including the edge of the beam, we have a simple boundary. So we have imported our geometry, we have created some materials and applied them to the problem, we have also set up our boundary conditions. So the last thing that we need to look at is 
the loading definition. So we'll go through it relatively quickly. If I turn on the display of loading, you can see there's nothing there at the moment. But what we do is go into this load case manager dialog and we can see here that we have loads that we can apply and a loads database. And so I'll quickly go through the different types that we're going to apply to this problem. So one of the things that we may want to look at is self-weight loads. So if we click on there, we can say it's unfavorable. Um, we may not want to increase that as part of the question that we're asking ourselves is whether it's uh, the slab is capable of holding these line loads. Um, but we might want to select all the solids and click OK. So that's very quickly added self-weight loading to the problem. Other types of load we might want to be considering are things like pressure loads. So I can add a new one here. And we have maybe the services that are importing maybe a small load, so 0.27 kilopascals, and that would be a permanent load. Similarly, we could have some construction loading, uh, slightly higher, maybe 1.65 kilopascals, and that would be variable. Um, and that moves us on then to line loads. So sometimes um, props have um, line loads associated with them. So we can look here, we can have prop one could have a line load of 18.5 kilonewtons per meter. Um, again, variable. And prop two, we'd say has a line load of 45 kilonewtons per meter. Again, that would be variable. And lastly, we look at point loads. So we may have some reaction forces from the props, and we all may, may also have some column loading going into the slab. So we can add some here. So if we look at a prop to reaction force, we can specify that it's 0.1 kilonewton. Um, again, variable. We can have a column dead load of 800 kilonewtons, which is permanent. And we can also have a column live load of 150 kilonewtons, which we specify as variable. So we have quite quickly set up a range of different loading conditions for or load types that we can use in our problems. So point loads, line loads, pressure loads, and self-weight loads. So if I OK that, now we can see if we come to this, we have our load case one. We've already assigned self-weight loading to it. The next thing we want to do is start looking at adding um, pressure loads. So we could add the services in, and we know that they're unfavorable. And we can, again, as we did with the pressure loading, just select where we want them to go. In this case, all over the slab, click OK. And they're added into this particular load case. Similarly, for line loads, we can select and say, OK, we have a line load for prop one. That's going to be unfavorable. We want to increase that as part of the um, analysis process and see whether it will cause failure. Um, at the moment, it's actually just positioned at zero, zero. If we change that, we can then you can see the cursor changes and we can just draw our line load in. The coordinates get put into that field. And if I click OK, you can see now that the line load has been applied across there. Let's go back into the load case manager. And um, for the last case, we have point loads and again, maybe prop two reaction. If we click change on there, we can see that again, we get a cross cursor and I can click on the beam and okay that. And if I zoom in, you can see we have the line load and we also have this pink dot with a cross in it, which signifies that there is a point load there. And for this particular problem, there are quite a few um, line loads and point loads. So what I'm gonna do here is actually just open a file where all of that loading has been applied already. So click on open and click on to solve. 
So we can see here, if I just show the loading again, we have all of our load cases defined. So we have all these prop loads, column loads, the little pink dots, and also the loading around the slab as pressure loading or self-weight loading. So we've defined our loads, we've applied our loads. So if I click back in here, you can see that they're listed all the way through. The last thing we need to do for this particular problem is to put in some partial safety factors. You can see actually here already they have been defined, but I'll just click on details. So by default, we would have um, partial safety factors of unity, but in this case, we have specified our own partial safety factor set um, for the ultimate limit state with these values for permanent variable and accidental actions within the problem. So if we wanted to, we could then potentially add more load cases with um, different partial safety factor sets or maybe different loading conditions. Um, in this case, we are just going to look at this single load case with this single partial safety factor set applied to it. Um, the next example will go into a little bit more detail about sev um, adding several load cases for representing a moving vehicle, but for this case, it's just the single one. So we're now We've got geometry, we've got materials, we have boundary conditions, and we have loading. So we have everything that's necessary to be able to solve this problem. We can see here on the right-hand side, we have a fine nodal density. Um, so that should give us a reasonably accurate solution within a short solve time. If I just click solve, we can see here that the software has set up the problem and is going through it. And it's very quickly within a couple of seconds found a critical solution which involves um, basically a, a sort of cantilevering of this top left hand corner to the left hand side of the column. The important thing that we are asking ourselves, and the, so the question we were asking was um, can this slab withstand the extra loading when we are doing this refurbishment work from the props and we can see here that the adequacy factor that it's come up with for the ULS partial safety factor set is 1.24 so we're saying with the factored loading applied to it we have an adequacy factor of 1.2 which is above 1 so like Matthew said earlier that's the value that we're looking for in order to say that um, the problem is okay for this particular um, setup so we would be happy that we can withstand that extra loading that is imparted due to the refurbishment works. Finally just for this one what we can also do is now that we have this we can click on report and you can see there are a lot of different sections that you can add into the report if I click OK and open that up, we can see it will come up with um, a report that you can save as a PDF and give you a, an overview of the failure mechanism as well as the adequacy factor and some information about the problem itself. Um, so that's actually sort of useful for, for yourselves and for also um, providing to clients if they need to um, see what the failure mechanism might be and what the factor of safety might be on there. So that was a quick step through um, a reasonably complex problem um, with static loading on it. What we're going to have a very quick look at now before we go on to the questions at the end is a second example. Uh, if I go back to the presentation, we're going to look at the case of some plant loading. So what we have in this particular problem is a relatively thin slab which is supported along two edges and the contractors want to take a um, item of plant, in this case it's uh, a front tipping um, dumper truck, to the right hand side of the slab. Um, it's going to have an imp an additional superimposed loading of about 4.6 kilonewtons per meter squared and the question that they're asking themselves is can the slab carry this proposed extra loading at the ultimate limit state so we can see at the bottom corner here we have the geometry of the um, piece of plant at the top we have the geometry of the slab itself and we have all the information there that we need to actually be able to set up and solve this problem so what I'm going to do is given that we don't have a lot of time left I will just open 
the file itself. So we can see here we have the geometry, we have a slab where the definition has already been made. So the bending moment capacity is 78 and 0.1, so very um, little um, reinforcement in the bottom of the slab, um, the top of the slab, sorry, but um, reasonable in the bottom. And we can also see if I display the loading that we have the pressure loading on the slab, but we also have these four dots, which are what we're using to represent the vehicle loading. So four point loads to represent each of the wheels of our piece of plant. So in this case, what we are wanting to do is if I open the load case manager, we can see we only have one load case defined at the moment where the vehicle is off the left hand side of the slab. What we want to do is actually move it to the right up to the right hand side. And that's quite easy with this. Um, all we do is select all of our loading. So we have the self weight and the superimposed loading, which are the pressure loads. We selected those and also the four 11 kilonewton point loads, which um, represent the vehicle loading. If I click that and then go to the action drop down here, we can copy all of those loads uh, with an offset. So in our case, we want to move it to the right. Uh, so we don't want any Y offset, but we're going to move the one meter at a time, six times to the right. So if I click OK there, we get a little warning that says that the self weight and the pressure loads don't offset. And that makes sense. You don't want um, pressure loading that doesn't um, attach itself to the slab itself. So we'll just click OK for that and click OK again. And we, what we can see now is that we have these seven tabs along the bottom and also at the top in the low case spin box, we can see it's the low case one of seven now. So if I just click the up arrow, you can see that those four point loads which represent the vehicle are moving across the slab and actually um, just off to the right hand side. So we have seven different load cases which represent that vehicle moving across. So now if I just click solve, we get a warning that some of the wheel loads exist outside the slab in some of the load cases. We're okay with that. We sort of understand that that's um, gonna happen. So we click okay. And what will very quickly occur is you'll see that the software is going through the different load cases and identifying the collapse mechanism and the adequacy factor associated with each of those. And at the end, it goes back to the one that gives you the lowest adequacy factor, so the critical load case. And in this case, it's load case six. Um, so if I just bring that animation back to the beginning, what we can see here if I start on zero and turn on the display of the vehicle again, you can see the different failure mechanisms that occur for each of the different load cases. Actually, they're all <coughs> reasonably similar, um, but we can see that the adequacy factor for load case six is 2.64, which is the lowest of all the seven. So we can see here that because, again, we've provided ultimate limit state partial factor set, to the problem it's well above one so what we're saying is that actually it can carry that additional loading that's provided by the plant reasonably well um, as we would expect the critical low case is where the plant is um, towards the right hand side of this slab with all four wheels actually imparting load through it once it's driven slightly off the side of it uh, then the safety factor goes up again so that was a very quick overview of just how to apply a moving load over a slab and showing that it can be done very, very quickly. So we're coming towards the end now. So the last thing to have a quick look at before any questions is just some conclusions. Um, so firstly, we've seen that the yield line method provides you with a powerful means of analyzing the ultimate or collapse limit state. Um, the lack of a general computer-based implementation of that method has limited its usage um, previously, but limit state slab has been developed to address this problem. And for buildings in particular, limit state slab can be used at both the design stage or to show that an existing slab has an additional reserve of strength that may be necessary if you're undertaking um, repurposing works. So 
with that in mind, we'll just go over to questions now. So if you do have any, feel free to um, ask them um, in the question functionality. I'll just have a click over to see if any have turned up. Okay, there was one that's come through that was just asking about the use of uh, boundary conditions on the inside of slabs rather than around the external boundaries. So we mentioned earlier um, the capability to use a uh, knife edge support. Um, just had a question about sort of what that does and how it works. So I'll just very quickly make a new problem. So if I start with a standard rectangular slab, first thing we want to do is change the external boundaries so we'll change some to simple and then we'll get rid of the top and the bottom there make those free so we can see here if I solve that what we'll get is um, what we would expect which is just a simple sort of folding buck type failure mechanism what we can do is then apply or draw a boundary along the middle there this one's slightly offset and then if we click on there you can see the support type is a knife edge and once we've added that in and solve it so our previous adequacy factor was 0.32 if I solve again now we again get that folding book type failure mechanism but the adequacy factor because of that extra support from the knife edge has gone up to 1.01 .01. and we can very easily sort of yeah sort of grab that and if we want oh, move it about and see what happens um, as Matthew said you can do sort of what if analysis very very quickly with this so here we just move that knife edge support and it's gone up to 1.37 for the adequacy factor um, and yeah you can use that very quickly um, especially if you're sort of doing design processes just to see what the effect is on the slab um, yeah, I see we've run out of time, so we do have another couple of questions, but what we'll do is get back to um, those people via email after the webinar, um, maybe either later today or on Monday, depending on um, the complexity of the answers. So just finally like to say thank you to Matthew and thanks to everybody who's joined us today. Um, we do hope that you found the webinar useful and informative. And as we mentioned at the start, if it has raised any questions that we haven't answered, then please feel free to get in touch at any time via info at limitstate.com and we'll be happy to get back to you. Um, Limitstate Slab is available to download or purchase from our website, which is www.limitstate.com and we'll um, be happy to um, talk to anybody who has any questions at all. So. Lastly, just like to say, please look out for our other webinars which deal with Limit State Slab and the other software products. Uh, we'll be sending out event notifications via email and also on social media um, in advance of these, and they'll also be posted on our website. Um, finally, just like to say again, thank you all for listening, and I hope that you can join us again for one of the future sessions. Goodbye.